everybody. Um, happy Tuesday. It's good to see you. Welcome to Second Cup with Keith. I'm Keith, and this is my second cup. Ah, yeah. So, yeah, I kind of wanted to jump on and talk to you guys uh, a little bit before I jump into continuing to write my next book. Uh, which will be the final book in the Jesus Sun series. But um, I was trying to think about, you know, what um, what should what what should I talk about? What should the, the topic be? And so I took a second to kind of mull over my head. There's sort of a a range of possible things that are kind of all bouncing around in my head at the moment. <clears throat> this is what it's like to be me. Um, that's why I make all these post-it notes and. Um, I write. I have this whiteboard. I write notes on of like ideas for blogs and books and videos, and because <clears throat> I've always got several things at once kind of floating around. So here's what I I felt like this morning, anywhere at least to to kick off this video uh, was at the top of my mind. Um, I just finished watching. Well, I, for the second time, I showed my mom. Uh, the documentary on Netflix called Wild Country, which is about this guy, the Bhagwan, and Rajneesh. And um, it's a fascinating documentary. If you haven't seen it, really recommend it. It's really, really good. Um, it kind of pairs really nicely with another documentary called Kumare, which I really recommend. <clears throat> it's K-U-M-A-R-E. Uh, that one's about a, a film director who gets the idea of basically inventing himself as a fake guru and demonstrating in the documentary just how easy it is to get people to uh, devote themselves to you and follow you and all of that. And um, so anyway, I guess in general, what's in my mind is, um, I mean, one of the things I'm struck with when I watch both of those documentaries is just how peop how desperate people are for for connection to God and to other people. And even, I think even, let's say specifically, people want a connection with God. They want a connection with other people, but they also, we also tend to want a connection with a guru, with a teacher. We attach ourselves to, you know, pastors, authors, teachers, leaders, um, that we like, that we feel like have wisdom, and, um, you know, um, people that we think have the answers, right? Now, uh, that's, that's a human thing, you know, I, I don't, I don't know that I'm, we're ever going to be able to really, uh, undo that, right? It's not enough for me to make a video here on Facebook, you know, and say, stop it. <laughs> don't do that. I don't, uh, it's kind of like mem the mimetic, you know, uh, the mimetic, you know, uh, reactions that people have. Like, we can't help it. We are mimetic. It's just part of who we are. And I think in many ways, part of that, when I say mimetic, you know, Ger Rene Girard's, um, thesis uh, that um, human beings are mimic the desires of other people. And I think we also then, as part of our mimicking other people, we desire what they desire. I think we also sort of, again, look for another human being to mimic their teaching, to mimic their wisdom, to mimic their um, insight. Like, we it's too difficult to go get my own wisdom. We'll put it this way, right? Um, for a lot of people, they want wisdom, let's say. They, they want to understand the Bible or God or life or, you know, lots of different topics. But it's really difficult. You know, we, you've got your job, you've got your family, you've got your life to live. You don't have time, you know, to buy 100 books on different these different topics and sit and read and study and make notes and underline and connect the dots and, you know, come up with your own um, ideas. And either you don't have the time to do it or you don't trust yourself that that if you did that, that you would 
come up with the right answer, right? You're, you're still kind of like unsure. Which direction should I go here? Which, which book should I even read? Which, you know, which, who should I listen to, right? And so again, it's, it seems to be that it's always sort of borrowed wisdom or borrowed uh, insight from this other person, other teacher. Now I say, even as I'm saying this, uh, I recognize that there are people out there uh, maybe watching this video right now, and for them, I'm their guru, right? I, oh, I, I love, what did Keith say about that? Um, and you know how I know that? It's because people ask me questions all the time. I, I get emails from people, private messages from people. Hey, Keith, um, someone is telling me this and that. Uh, how would you respond? And, uh, and again, I'm not saying that. I'm not putting people down for that. I, 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 I'm happy to answer those kinds of questions. But what I'm saying is, we as human beings tend to elevate other people and we borrow their wisdom, we borrow their insight. This is what's happening with these gurus, right? Um, and so I just wanna say it happens. There is, this, there is this relationship. There's the teacher, guru, leader, sage, satrap, pastor, uh, whatever you wanna label you wanna use. And then there's the student, the disciple, the follower, the reader, uh, you know, the the um, the pew sitter, the parishioner, <clears throat> whatever, right? Uh, the laity. And so I get it. There is that relationship there. Um, but if you if you find yourself in that other category. In other words, you don't think of yourself as the, as the teacher, leader, you know, guru, whatever. Uh, you're the other. You're, you're, you're the person who is reading books and listening to speakers and following certain people, you know. Um, and, and, and you find yourself on that side of the equation, uh, then I'm talking to you. Uh, maybe I'll say something in a second if you find yourself on the teacher side. But let's, for the second, let me just talk to you if you find yourself on the learner side of that equation, not the teacher, but the learner. Man, it's interesting that I decided today to do it on this. Um, but yeah, the more I thought about it, I thought, yeah, this is something I'd like to address. Um, you know, within Christianity, specifically, the, there's this, um, <clears throat> there these assumptions that are promoted within Christianity. And it's, it's usually, again, coming from the teacher and using the Bible as a sort of authority um, to reinforce the idea to the learner, the disciple, the student, etc., to tell them that their thoughts are wicked all the time, that they cannot trust their own voice, they can't trust their own thoughts, that all of their thoughts are deceitful all of the time, um, that there's nothing good in them, right? <clears throat> we, we reinverse these things. This is part of this worm theology. But I want you to understand there's a, there's a method to that. Like it, it's not just we like beating people up emotionally. Like there's a, there's a reason why that teaching gets promoted either overtly or covertly, you know, um, outwardly or sort of subtly. Uh, how it gets reinforced within Christian circles. Um, and you can probably guess why, right? Um, it's because the teacher wants to create people who are dependent upon the teacher. Don't read the Bible for yourself. Come and listen to me. Don't trust your understanding. You're just going to get confused. Or your evil, sinful mind is going to twist up that scripture and twist up that teaching, and you're going to end up you know, led astray down the path of destruction. Just come and listen to me and I'll explain it to you. I'll tell you uh, what to think and what to believe. And so there's a measure of, um, there's a measure of comfort and security and safety in that. Like, oh, whew, good. I don't have to be the one to think about this too hard. I don't have to be the one to figure this out. And by the way, of course there's safety because this beautiful and amazing and wise, kind, giving, loving teacher is going to protect me 
from my own tendency to self-destruct and to lead myself off into um, false teaching and, and things like that, right? And this, by the way, gosh, it's such, it's, first of all, it's very, very pervasive uh, in, in the Christian church. Um, I don't think I've ever met anybody, certainly through deconstruction, uh, people who are going through deconstruction, um, this is like a common denominator. I don't think I've ever met anybody who didn't feel that way and didn't even buy into it, right? So um, I, I'm addressing this issue to say to you, if you're someone, again, who finds yourself on the learner, disciple, student side of the equation, resist that. In other words, don't offload responsibility for your own truth to me. Please, God, not to me or anybody else. Um, number one, I don't want that burden. I don't ever want anyone to say, well, keep child says. Like, stop. Don't do that. Um, I mean, if you want to ask for advice, sure. But, I mean, there's a thin line between asking someone, you know, for advice about something or asking their perspective on something. Listen, I do it too. There are people that I respect uh, who I, I know they know more than I do about certain topics and I shoot them emails all the time myself and I go, hey, what do you think about this or that? And I listen and you know, I get their reaction. Now, I don't have, I, I get their answers, but I'm not, I don't have to accept it. I could take their answer and go, hmm, yeah, I don't know about that, right? So, Here's, here's a couple of things I want us to think about. Um, my friend Jim Palmer actually was the person who, um, he and I are having a conversation actually during the um, Square 2 course that I put together. And uh, one of our sessions, Jim and I were talking kind of about this topic, um, about sort of like how we've been taught to mistrust ourselves and, um, and we offload our uh, spiritual development and, and understanding to a guru or a teacher and he said you know well yeah there are there are ways we can know whether or not something is true how we can evaluate uh, teachings or statements or truth statements specifically that come from uh, teachers or gurus or uh, you know the wise the wise people and so he outlined three, three of these things, okay? And I'm going to share them with you. Again, not, a, not original with me, but I'm sharing them with you because I think actually he's onto something. I think this is right. Um, it's this idea of how you, for yourself, can determine whether or not something is true or not. Um, and so those three things are direct experience, critical thinking, and self-reflection. Those three things. And I think when you come to anything, in other words, you hear, you hear a statement, you hear somebody say something under the authority of Scripture, the Bible says, and then they give you some, you know, some verses, and then they have a teaching, and then therefore this proves blah, blah, blah. I would encourage you to begin developing the habit of, taking that thought, taking that teaching, that idea, and sitting quietly and evaluating it using those three things. Does that, does that statement, does that teaching, does it resonate with my own direct experience? Is this, is this a, a truth that I have encountered in my living my daily life? Yes or no? That's one. Then uh, the, the next sort of test to apply to it would be critical thinking. Think about it critically. Is that true? If that's true, then what? Right? Um, take some time to chew on it. Really think about it. Work out the implications of it. If this is true, then what about this? Right? Uh, apply some critical thinking to it. And by the way, if you've not done a lot of critical thinking in your life up till now, that might be really challenging. But I would, again... I would, Developing that muscle in your brain uh, that, that helps you to think critically about things is so key and so important. It's, the, it's one of the main things you're going to need, one of the main skills you're going to need so that you don't get duped 
by people, right? You don't have some teacher just giving you a load of crap and it sounds good and he's got a bunch of Bible verses to support it, but you know what I mean? If without some critical thinking, you're just going to fall for anything. I mean, you're at the whim of, you're just talking about, you know, the Bible talks about that. You're just somebody taught, someone who's tossed back and forth to and fro by any wind and wave of doctrine. Because you need a plumb line to say, how do I evaluate and determine whether or not I, I believe, accept, or reject this as either true or false? Okay? So again, direct experience. Does it, does it align itself with your personal, everyday, living your life, direct experience, number one. Number two, when you apply critical thinking to that, whatever this teaching is, does it square? Does it make sense? Does it seem like, you know what? Yeah, that, that does make sense. That does feel like, like, okay, yeah, I, I, can, I, I think that makes sense. And um, a third one is sort of self-reflection. I mean, spending some time with whatever this idea or this teaching is, you know, spend some time, just spend some time in self-reflection. Now, I, I've added a fourth um, element to this, to these processes. And um, so again, let me reaffirm, uh, I, I, what I'm trying to do is getting, uh, uh, helping you as the student develop these critical thinking skills, these, these, this, you know, applying direct experience, uh, applying self-reflection um, and this fourth thing I'm going to suggest so that you can mature to the place that you're not always dependent upon a guru or a teacher or a leader out there somewhere to determine what's true. So the fourth thing would be, and this is a little tricky because I, I think it, I think um, I have to, I have to clarify and qualify this fourth thing that I'm adding to Jim's list. And that is sort of like a peer review or, or trusted friendships. Um, so in other words, I think it's important to add that fourth thing because yes, um, those three things that Jim suggests are teaching you that you can trust your own judgment. You can trust yourself. By the way, Paul says that we have the mind of Christ. What does that mean? That means you have the ability to determine things for yourself. Um, in fact, let me just take a little tangent here for a second on that, that idea before I move on to explain the fourth. I'm sorry. I'm jumping around a bit, but stick with me. Um, so we stick with Jim's first three things. Direct experience, critical thinking, self-reflection. Do you know what? Uh, I think you could also demonstrate from the scriptures that that Jesus would say amen to this. And here's why. Um, you know, the Heretic Happy Hour, we do, we're doing a, we're actually, we just finished up last night recording the final episode of the, the series. We've been doing a series on the parables. And so the fascinating thing about parables is that there is no one answer. Like, think about it. If Jesus wanted to teach um, a direct teaching, Hey, everybody, listen to this. Here, I want you to get this one exact thing that I want you to understand. Um, telling a parable is the worst way to do that. Because most of Jesus' parables are these open-ended stories that are open to interpretation and could mean lots of things to lots of people and can be applied in different ways in different situations. But I would argue that's on purpose. When Jesus tells parables to teach something, it's not because he wants you to get one and only one possible answer or, or idea out of the parable. Jesus tells the parable with certain principles and, and, and in place within the story, within the parable, so that you and I can bring the meaning to it. We, we are the ones who can make sense of it. And so our interaction with that parable and using our own brain, our own mind, our own, yes, our own direct experience, our own critical thinking, our own self-reflection, the parable allows us to use those three things, the brain God gave us, to work out some something that's true in it that we need in that moment. So in other words, parables are open to these interpretations. Uh, and so it's not a direct 
this and only this kind of a thing. Um, so I, I would argue that the fact that Jesus teaches in parables so often uh, is a testimony to how much Jesus values and trusts your ability to listen, think about it, reflect on it, and arrive at a nugget of truth in it that you can carry with you that is meaningful to you, that means something true and real. Um, without just giving you the thing, like he could, if that's what he, if he wanted to give you a specific nugget, he would just say, you know, listen to this, boom, 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 period, and we're done. There's no story. There's nothing to work out. What does this stand for? What does that stand for? What does that mean? Well, why did he do that in the story? What you know what I mean? The parable invites you and I to to use our direct experience, critical thinking, and self reflection. <laughs> that's what the parable is designed to do and it's the holy spirit trusting you and i with you with that we've got the capability we have the mind of christ that we have the spirit of christ living within us you know there's a verse in first john that says that that the anointing of the spirit remains on you and you don't need anyone to teach you anything you know that did you know that by the way that's also the promise of the new covenant we're living under a new covenant now right and go and read what it, the new covenant is all about the new covenant is all about the fact that Every single one of us can directly know God ourselves directly. We don't need anyone, even says specifically, no one will go to anyone else and say, know the Lord. I don't need to go to another person to have this other person explain it to me. That's what 1 John is saying also. Why? Because the Spirit of Christ is, is living in you, because the, you are anointed. So Jesus was the anointed. That's what a Messiah means. That's what Christ means, right? The, the anointed one. Well, now the scriptures say, you're anointed. Yes, you're anointed in the same way that Christ was anointed. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. Okay? So can you trust your own direct experience, critical thinking, self-reflection? Yes, you can. Absolutely you can. And so, anyway, so I think there's a lot of great reasons for us as people who are now the incarnation of Christ in the world to, to move beyond this fear-based, there's nothing good in me. I have to just listen to whatever Pastor Bob says and trust that he knows what he's doing, and I'm just going to offload my responsibility for my own spiritual development and understanding to him. No, you don't. Don't do that. Please don't do that. Stop. Because then, then we're no better than these gurus, than these people that fo blindly follow these gurus and give themselves over to, I'm sorry, most of the time these guys are charlatans, you know, and they're, they're, they're uh, manipulating you and exploiting you for their own benefit, whether they're doing it in small ways or subtle ways or very overt, dangerous ways. Um, just don't put yourself in that situation. I just feel like this is not God's heart for you and I. You know, you, uh, I wrote a blog a while back, you were meant for better things than sitting in a pew. You were meant for better things than just singing songs once a week. You know what I mean? We have this incredible glorious opportunity to dance with the spirit of the living god the christ within us who knows us and loves us and and wants to reveal himself to us and reveal ourselves to ourselves and that's something that only happens in if you and i participate directly with the holy spirit within us if we experience it um and we we ourselves come to know it it's not uh, an intellectual thing, right? It's a, it, it, it's an experience. It's a practice. It's a practicum, not not some sort of out there theology you know, theorem, but a, a practicum, right? Something we actually experience. Okay. So having said all that, like I said, I'm, I've added a fourth thing, <clears throat> which I again I call. I haven't really decided. I don't. I'm not landed on a name that I feel like I'm, uh, that I've nailed it. But it's in essence, it's sort of like. Yeah, um, feedback or you know community, community involvement, community uh, reflection, um, insight from trust from trusted friends, that kind of a thing. So what what I don't mean is that again you just offload responsive the full responsibility of, of what's true or not to to your peers, right? To a group of people who are just shouting you down and say, 
no, that doesn't conform to what we think, so that's wrong. I don't mean that. I mean, people, probably a very small group of people, you know, two or three or four people, um, again, that love, that, that, that you have a deep connection with. They know you, they love you, they believe in you, they care about you. They love you no matter what you think or believe, right? So your um, connection to these people isn't based on conformity to an agreement of a certain doctrines. Now, for some of you, that doesn't exist. You don't have any connections with anybody who, who thinks of you that way and who relates to you that way. It, so if that's you, this might not apply. But um, having people in your life who unconditionally, they love you no matter what you believe, they love you if you believe something different than them, they love you, they care about you, and they're connected to you and committed to you. So the, whoever those people are for you, I hope you have at least one person in your life like that, maybe two or three people in your life like that. Um, after you've gone through sort of the process of thinking about something when, and applying direct experience, critical thinking, and self-reflection, you would also go to these handful of people that you are these trusted advisors, trusted friends, um, and you would bounce it off of them. You'd say, you know, here's what I think I'm seeing. What do you think? And, and here's, why, here, here's why I think that fourth element is so important. And, I, and it's simply because of this. And I'm just speaking from my own experience. We all have a blind spot, right? You know that, right? <laughs> you and I have to admit there are certain things about ourselves that we're unaware of, that we don't notice or recognize. Um, and so you need someone in your life who loves you enough to tell you, you know, you got the broccoli in your teeth or actually that response was a little, you know, not very kind or, you know, Keith, yeah, but sometimes you've got this tendency and, you know, you should be careful of that, right? Just people who gently love you enough to remind you or point out to you these blind spots, okay? Again, it's not somebody who's going to remind you what a sinner and a slob and a loser and a degenerate you are. That's not what I'm saying. I mean, again, someone who really loves you, cares about you, but can lovingly point out to you sort of the speck in your eye because they've already dealt with the log in their own eye. Um, <clears throat> and so it's, it's just simply, I, I could just say, there's, a, there's been times in my life when, you know, I, I've thought something and, I, and I've applied those three things that, that Jim outlines to, my, to the best of my ability. And I think I've arrived at the answer. But when I engage in dialogue and in conversation with these people in my life that I love and I care about and, and, um, and I'm not afraid to be myself with, and they're not afraid to speak truth to me, you know what? Sometimes they'll, they'll reflect back to me some things. They'll point out some flaws in that thinking. Um, they'll expose some of the blind spots that I have. And, and I'll go, oh, you know what? Mm, thank you. I, you're right. I didn't think about that or I didn't see that. Or I didn't consider that. It's just being able to have someone reflect back to you what you're saying. And, and, and then, you know, so you're doing your thing. You're, you're applying your direct experience, your critical thinking, and your self-reflection. But your, your friends also have direct experience that might be different than yours. Your friends also might have critical thinking that might see something you don't see. Your friends might also have some self-reflection that would be beneficial to you to hear it, right? Just to receive it from them. Now, again, this fourth element is not intended to um, supersede those other three. I, I'd say they would all be taken together at once. And so you, you and I are under no obligation if we take it to some of these people that we care about and, and they give us their response, they give us their reaction, their direct experience, critical thinking, self-reflection, and it's different than what we thought, we can consider it, we can think about it, we can say, oh, I never thought about that, that's okay, yeah, I see what you're saying. But at the end of the day, we're still totally free to say, but I still think this is true. Based on, again, our, our own ability, using the mind of Christ that we all have, using the anointing of, uh, of Christ that remains on us, that we don't need anyone else to teach us. But it also... See, that whole thing about saying, you know, you don't need anyone to teach you, it doesn't mean you're not teachable. Please understand that. 
that verse isn't saying you don't when it says you don't need anyone to teach you it doesn't mean you're not teachable it doesn't mean oh I, I have nothing to learn from anybody else of course we do everyone does so we always have to remain in a posture of humility of saying I don't know everything and I'm open and interested in what a variety of people have to say about something but see again now I've already I've already moved away from this idea of having only one guru only one teacher or maybe a handful of teachers right if um, you know if, if Brian Zahn didn't say it if Brian Zahn disagrees with it or Brad Jerzak or David Bentley Hart these, by the way these are my some of my gurus um, well then I have to reject that idea and see that's that's not what I'm saying I'm saying sure you've got some people that you really like authors that you read people that you look up to you appreciate their wisdom and insight but at the end of the day you recognize that you know what I can go another direction uh, I'm open and free to consider ideas that others might go I don't know and then you'd say well that's okay uh, I do believe this right now so the I recognize there's also this thing where there's fear right we have these fears that um, if I have the wrong ideas if I have wrong theology if I have um, you know if I believe something that's wrong that I'm in some kind of spiritual danger um, if I die believing this thing and I'm wrong about it I'm gonna go to hell well it's fascinating when you <laughs> when you when you uh, deconstruct the the notion of eternal torment and you move into what I've done which is to say you know, I, I think universal reconciliation is in the scripture I see historically it's what Christians have believed for the first 500 years of church history um, eternal torment doesn't it's not in the Old Testament it's not taught by Jesus all those verses where it's not that's not what he's talking about uh, so I can I can just kind of push that to the side I reject this idea of eternal torment so that's off the table now so I don't have any fear that the big huge hammer that's been used to hold over me that you better not believe the wrong things is gone and so now I'm like you know what it doesn't matter if I believe something wrong or it's okay um, you I can believe it here's the thing to recognize it too that beliefs evolve and grow and change so I might believe something right now but you know I'm gonna I'm not done thinking I'm not done applying direct experience critical thinking self-reflection and community feedback um, I'm always thinking about things I'm always evaluating things I'm always listening to other voices I'm always reading other books and then that that idea that I had six months ago three years ago where I changed my mind about something I can change it again and I'm free to do that and that's okay I don't have to be afraid that God's gonna get me if I if I'm wrong about something right it's okay to think it through again uh, if Jesus was so concerned about us believing the wrong things he wouldn't have been he wouldn't have spent the majority of his teaching teaching parables where people were free to come up with different understandings of that parable and continue to think about it and later on have another idea and see something else in the parable they didn't see the first time that's okay and I think I think that's the freedom that we have as people made in the image of God who have the mind of Christ who have the Spirit of Christ living it within us uh, this anointing uh, uh, the, the, the Christ anointing that remains on us that leads us to all truth um, and sort of rest and relax in that ability so uh, all of this to say um, I would love to help more people who find themselves in the student category to move a little closer to the not the teacher category in the sense of like oh you need to teach other people something like oh, no, I need to I need to set myself up as I'm a teacher that's not what I'm saying but to but to give yourself personal autonomy and authority and permission to evaluate things about what is true and what is it for yourself without borrowing um, insight without borrowing authority or, or whatever from me or any other teacher or guru out there in other words I guess the bottom line is you don't need a guru you don't need a teacher and I'll tell you right now I don't want to be anybody's guru I absolutely do not um, it scares me when people are like say things like that like oh Keith says you know, don't do that please um, 
I, I would rather that you think about it. Like if I say something and, you, and, it, and it strikes you, and then, okay, now you think about it. You consider it. You run it through all these filters. And then if you decide it, then it's not Keith says, it's I, I think, right? Because you own it. You considered it. You thought about it. You didn't borrow it from somebody else. It's yours. And it's okay if you get it from a different source, different sources. Maybe you got that from Brad Jerzak and you got that from uh, Kenneth Tanner and you got that from Baxter Kruger and I don't know, whatever. Um, but being able to yourself trust yourself and your own ability to know something is true or not true. That's, uh, that's my encouragement today. Um, and I hope that makes sense. I hope you understand what I'm, where I'm coming from on that. Um, again, it's just because I watched these documentaries um, about these people so desperate for connection to God, to other people, but also connection to this wise leader that they're willing to just give up everything and, and surrender everything, including their own mind and their own will. That's dangerous. Please, please, please don't ever put yourself in that kind of a situation. Um, don't be that kind of a person. Don't be that kind of a student or disciple. Like, be a thinker. Be someone who knows something because you have thought about it and you know it because you know it. Um, not that we should all be about knowing. Again, I, I'm all for this idea of embracing mystery and confessing that we don't know everything. And, and it's not really about knowing. It's more about, well, I believe or I kind of think this is the, my best guess at the moment sort of a thing. But it's your best guess at the moment. It's, it's, it's the best guess that you've arrived at, not just because Keith said so, or Brad said so, or whoever said so. Um, it's your best guess because you have, you have thought about it, you've studied, you considered, you put it through these three, four you know, filters, and you own it. You've decided, you know what, this is where I am right now. But even then, here, here's my thing, I'm big on this. Even when you think you've arrived at something that you've applied all these processes to and you think, okay, this is the nugget of truth that I have dug out of the ground for myself. I have considered it. I've tested it and tried it and you know, put it on the anvil and, and uh, hammered out the sparks and figured out what's true and what isn't. But I did it for myself. But when you don't hold so dogmatically to that thing um, that you're unable to hear new information. You're, you're unable to continue. Like... That idea should stay soft. That cement should not dry. Um, I'll just tell you right now, I, uh, over my lifetime, I have changed my views on lots of different things theologically. And other things too, but theologically, definitely changed my views on different things. And um, it's just so much less painful when you deconstruct and rethink and reconsider uh, ideas if it's not something you have held so tightly and that cement is so hard that breaking it up is painful to you. If we can hold loosely to the things we believe, that we're open to another idea. We're not closed. We don't, we don't put up our dukes. Somebody challenges that idea. We don't fight them. We listen. What do you think? Maybe they, oh, maybe they've thought about that before. Or maybe I have thought about it before, but now well, let me reconsider it. You know, just be open to this is how we learn, okay? And it's the difference between being in a posture of someone who is a learner, a lifelong learner. You can't be a lifelong learner if you're not open to the possibility that you're not right about something or everything. Or, or if, you're, if you're not open to the idea that you still have something to learn. Uh, again, we have to be, we have to remain teachable, right? Um Anyway, I hope that's helpful. I hope that makes sense. Uh, Yosef says, for, for whoever is watching, I just want to recommend Square One. God bless you, brother. Thank you. I do too recommend Square One. Square One starts up again. Actually, wow, we're starting again next month. Yikes. I guess I better start letting people know about that. Yeah, the next round of Square One uh, begins in August, beginning of August. So if you're curious about that, let me know. Uh, by the way, so Square One is a 90-day online course and community that I created about two years ago where we take like 15 to 20 people through a 12-week, 90-day course. Uh, we walk through deconstruction, uh, from deconstruction into reconstruction 
of our faith. Um, and there's a really awesome community of people who are on the same page, who are in the same place you are, deconstructing their faith, looking to reconstruct their faith. Uh, it's been a blast. It's one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. Uh, I'm so glad <laughs> I started this group because it's just, I love it. I mean, it's helping me a lot too. So it's a, it's a wonderful group. Yeah, ne the next round will start in August. Uh, Brent says, good morning, Keith. Good morning to you, my friend. Uh, Yosef says, I like Peter Rollins' idea of the last guru. Yes, which should be you. You're the, you're the last guru. Kenton asks, do you think the teacher is always conscious of that sort of cult behavior? Well, I think so, Kenton. I do. Because, see, I've had lots of conversations with people who are teachers um, who have talked about that feeling you know that uh, you have this experience when you're a teacher. I'll just say that I've done this, and I've had these, and I've had conversations with other teachers who who uh, resonate with this, who who say yes, they, they've experienced this too. Um, there's a moment when you're teaching somebody, whether it's a group of people, usually it's in a group, and you will get the feedback from that group, maybe from a few individuals, of absolute and total abandonment, surrender to you and to your ideas and your intellect and you excuse me you have this realization that oh my gosh these people are completely in my hand i can they've they've given themselves to me completely and i've got to tell you there are there are one or two reactions if you're the teacher and you're in a moment where you realize oh my gosh i've got these people in my hand they will, they will believe anything I say. They will do anything I say. Your reaction is either, oh, crap, or, oh, good. And depending on the kind of person you are, um, those are your two reactions. And that, that's the scary thing for the student because the student completely trusts and believes that the guru, the teacher, the leader is good. But you don't know that. And so you might believe, and again, watching all these documentaries about these cult leaders who have gone off the deep end and exploited people and uh, manipulated people and abused people and all sorts of horrible things, see, that's what's happening. Because at some point in their teaching, in their ministry, whatever, they recognized, they had that moment where they realized, oh my gosh, I could do or say anything and these people will do it. They'll follow me. And your, your reaction, again, is either, how far can I take this? I wonder how far I can push this. Because now I see all kinds of benefits in this for me. Whoa. Right? That's scary. Or your reaction is really what's always been my reaction, which is like, oh, crap. Stop. No, no, no. Please don't do that. That's why I, don't, I tell people, don't call me pastor. I'm not your pastor. Um, I tell people in square one all the time, I'm, I do not want to be your guru. I am not your guru. I want to give you tools so that you can decide for yourself what is true. Where are you at? What makes sense to you? I'm not going to tell you what that is. And, and when, we, like, when we go into the reconstruction phase of square one, I always say, I'm, I'm going to lay out in front of you like a, um, they used to call them a, a smorgasbord, a, uh, sort of like a, um, a buffet of options for you. I'm not going to tell you what to what to choose, but I'm going to give you a many, many options. And I'm going to encourage you to try certain things. Maybe you haven't thought about You haven't tried before. Just try it out. And hopefully you're going to find some things that you're going to say, well, you're going to have two reactions. You're going to try some things and go, this was awesome. Oh, yes, this helps me so much. Or you're going to try some things and say, ugh, I did not like that. That was a waste of my time. I hated it. Great. So figure out for yourself what works for you, what makes sense to you, what practices are good for you, and do that. But please don't do it because I said so. And please don't do it because, well, Keith does this, so I'm going to do it. No, don't do that. Um, but I do think, yeah, I think uh, I've talked to a lot of teachers. Um, I have a friend, Lisa, she's a yoga instructor, and she says, yes, she has absolutely had people come to her and just completely surrender themselves completely their whole lives like, should I divorce my spouse? Should I quit my job? Should I do all these things? And, and whatever you say in that moment, they will do it because they trust you completely. And that's terrifying. It should be terrifying. 
uh, if you're if you're any any quality or kind of, of person, uh, your, your reaction should be, oh no 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 no, nope, this is terrifying. I don't I don't want to be in this situation. Right? I would rather train people to think for themselves, uh, to find that inner voice, that inner connection with God, so they can make up their own understanding, uh, make up their own mind about what path they should take, what what they should follow, what makes sense to them. But a good question, Ken. Uh, John Gardner says, good morning. Jesus told the woman caught in adultery to go and sin no more. One thought is based on flat assumption of no more sinning. Another is that it was don't do that sin anymore. A third was basically telling her she did not have to do this anymore. What does Keith find in this? Well, that is a completely different question. Again, John, based on what I just finished saying, what I want to say to you is, what makes sense to you, John? What do you think? And, and, and in essence, who gives a crap what I think? Because, I, again, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to tell people here's what to think because then they won't think. I would rather people learn the skills to read the passage, ask those questions. Those are really good questions. What did Jesus mean there? And then not just what did Jesus mean to her in that moment. What would Jesus mean to me and you? in that context what would he say to me and you or how how is what he said to her applicable to me and again that's a great exercise i would encourage us to learn how to do that how to how to intelligently thoughtfully uh carefully walk through those and consider those things engage your brain you have the mind of Christ. What makes sense to you? But again, process that in connection with other people, in relationships with other people that you also think about and you, know, you trust. So like, go through the process. Think through yourself. Okay, in that situation, um, what's my direct experience of something like this? What, let me use some critical thinking to what Jesus says and what I think is going on here. Right? self reflection Spend some time reflecting on this. And then take that to a group of people that you trust and go, hey guys, I've already thought this through. I read the scripture. Here's my process. I thought about this. I considered that. I realized this. I, I thought of this other thing. What do you guys think? Get their feedback. Then take all of that together and make up your own mind. Score. That's the way to do it. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, okay, Matthew. Matthew Colley just has some jokes here. I'm not going to read them. Um, Uh, Alan Earl says, this was helpful. I don't feel God is out to get me, but I do have a concern about living a life that brings glory to God. It doesn't appear that many teachers have adequately explained what the fear of God means. Consequently, many people have an unhealthy, paralyzing fear of God. So, Alan, interesting, interesting comment. Um, I would encourage you and everyone listening when it comes to this idea of, you said, you know, I have a concern about living a life that brings glory to God. That's great. I think it's a, it's a noble desire to say, I want my life to be one that brings glory to God. So what would that look like? Again, spend some time thinking about that. What, what would it look like for my life to bring glory to God? Make a list of things of what you, what you think makes sense. What would bring glory to God? And really think about it. Is this a good list? Right? Okay. I would also encourage you to do what Jesus does for us. Now, I think, again, because I think Jesus is so critical to this whole process. Jesus frames our relationship to God as with children to a loving father. So, Alan, I think you're a father. You have children, right? Think about your own children. This is, this is such an important thing. What if your children came to you and said, Alan, Dad, they wouldn't call you Alan, would they? They'd call you Dad. If your children came to you and said, Dad, 
I want to live a life that pleases you. I want to live a life that, um, that honors you, Dad. What should I do? What would you say to them? Now, again, in that moment, if they really did come to you and say to you, Dad, I want to live a life that, that brings glory to you, that, means, that brings joy to you, that, that makes you happy. I want, to, I want to live my life in a way that, that honors you, Dad. What should I do with my life? Now, I don't know about you, but if my sons came to me and said that, first of all, I'd be so blessed. I'd be so blessed if they would do that. It would be, that would bless me so much that that would be their heart's desire. But, but how would I respond to them? You know what I want for my boys, for my kids? I would say, you know what I want for you? You know what would bring me joy? You know what bring me glory? It would make me so proud of you that I would want to be able to look at people. Look at, look at that. That's my son. I want you to be the best you you can possibly be. Find the things that give your life meaning and do those things. If you're an artist, please paint, draw, create. If you're a musician, sing, write, you know, compose. Whatever it is that you do that makes you, you, be that. Do that. That brings me joy. That will bring me glory. That will make me so happy and so proud of you as my child. I don't think there's any better answer to that question than that right there. What, what do you have to do to bring glory to God? Be you. Be who he created you to be. What father, what father would go to their kid who, asked, who, who came to them in that level of humility and say, Mom or Dad, I, I want to live a life that glorifies you and would say, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to law school. I want you to get a degree. I want you to be the top of your class. I want you to be a litigator. I want you to earn this much money. I want you to live in this kind of house or anything like that. Like, Here's what I want you to do. I want, I want you to be this thing. I'm going to control you and make you be something. That's not a loving parent. And I would say God isn't doing that either. The right response of a loving parent to that kind of a question would be, oh, you know, it brings me joy. I just love sitting here and watching you play. I love sitting here and watching you laugh. I love sitting here and watching you enjoy the life I gave you. Nothing brings me more joy than watching you more and more every day become the amazing person I created you to be. Just do that. Man, that brings me the most joy ever. That's, that's how I would respond to that question. But again, take that. Think about that. Apply all that to it. Does that make sense to you? Does, does that seem to, is that good to you? I mean, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Bounce that off some other people. Bounce that scenario off some other people and along with your own ideas and see, see what rises to the top, see what makes sense. But I think it's a good thing to ask. Absolutely. Good thing to consider. Mike Zinker says, hello, sneaking in a warm Canadian hello. Uh, John says, I was just curious as to your thoughts on it. Yes, I understand, John. But again, you understand what I'm saying, right? <laughs> um, right I mean you if you want to know my whole thing about like go and sin no more in general I mean my whole thing about that is I feel like Christians and churches and pastors are way too fixated on sin what is a sin is that a sin is this a sin what's the worst sin what's the you know the most abominable the most what's the unforgivable sin 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 we're also focused on sin let me tell you if whatever you're looking for is what you will see if you are looking for sin, that is what you will see it. You'll see it everywhere, and that's all you'll see eventually is sin because that's what you're looking for. But I would encourage you, here's what Jesus does with sin. He forgives it. Here's what the Father has done with sin in, in um, 2 Corinthians 5.19. It tells us this, For God was in Christ not counting our sins against us, but reconciling the world to himself. So, what do I think about this whole idea about sin? I think you should let yourself be forgiven. Let yourself experience the reality that God is not counting any of your sins against you. He's forgiven him completely. It's part of the new covenant again. Go look in Hebrews under the new covenant. It says, God says, he declares, I will surely not remember their sins again. That's right. So who's remembering your sins? Not God. Who's holding your sins against you? Not God. 
So why are we doing it? Why are you doing it to yourself? Stop it. Don't do that. So if, if go and sin no more means anything, I think go and sin no more means go and live a life, as we were saying, that glorifies God, that, that, that your focus is on being the beautiful and amazing human being God has made you to be, and stop fixating on sins. Amen? Or not. Again, that's what I'm telling you. Run it through that filter. Does that make sense to you? If it does, great. If not, okay. That's okay. Yeah, anyway, I hope, uh, thank you, Alan. Alan says, makes sense. Yes, good thoughts on what brings glory from a father's perspective. Yes. Amen. So this was great. I mean, at least I had fun. Uh, I had to get this off my chest. Um, I hope this is helpful. And um, if, that, if I could find a way to just kind of make that uh, major on that, like, help people to me again what is this 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 whole idea of what i'm talking about you know what this is very simply um this is discipleship right discipleship is to yourself be a disciple a follower of christ who helps other people also become followers of christ but it's a it's a reciprocal thing i'm learning from you just as much as you're learning from me and we're all learning from one another it's not a top-down thing we're all equal we're all brothers and sisters here right there's a christ in you there's christ in me and the Christ in me needs the Christ in you and learns from the Christ in you, which learns from the Christ in me. And um, it's, it's this connected thing. And so that's what I'm talking about. I, I hope that we can move away from this guru, disciple, or teacher, follower, or leader, student relationship and move into this more shared thing of like, I've got some experience of Christ. What's yours? Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, I think that makes sense. Oh, that's cool. So it's, it's this... I'd like to pull it back down a little bit more to this equality of recognition. We're all learners, and we're all teachers, potentially, in some way. Um, and, and we can all learn from one another, right? So, uh, Leanne says, hey, brother, just stop missing the boat. Catch the next one, and remember, we're all in, in one union. Amen. Uh, she, is, she says, all walk out of fear and embrace the love we are equal and daddy is not mad at us but loves us. Amen. Love it. All right, guys. Um, I guess I'm going to let it go there. Uh, this has hopefully been helpful and an encouragement and a blessing to you guys. Uh, I love you. Appreciate you. Thank you for your support and um, we'll see you again down the road. All right. Take care.